a word of welcome today for those who are watching online. Uh, what a great uh, uh, joy it is to have an ever-growing community online as well. And also a shout out to our other campus because we are one ministry in two locations at Washington Park today. Uh, our youth director, Matthew Walton, is uh, delivering the message there. And uh, it's just a great joy to, to be able to see men and women being released in the power of the gospel, uh, to share the grace and the love that God has given to us. Um, and it's, a, it's my delight today to begin a new sermon series called can, can anyone want to guess the name? It's, there's three words in it. Anyone want to care to guess? Thank you, because I was going to wait for you. I wasn't going to move on at all. We're just going to stay there. Um, I also wanted to give another shout out this morning. Uh, one of uh, my wife and I, Bernadine, I's uh, college friends, uh, Christy, is visiting with us here today. And it's just great to have you with us. You can clap for her. Yep, that's yep, true. She's used to applause when she enters a room. Um, Christy, I want you to know, since you knew me in college, I have matured, I have grown, I've moved beyond petty humor like puns and things like that, and uh, uh, just uh, really great to get to worship Jesus with you today. Um, uh, Christy and I sang in a group together called Christy Crooks, uh, from the name Christy Crooks as me he looks, uh, the cross of Christ is light to me uh, during our college days. And uh, it's great to just get to offer up songs of worship today. Great, big God. Over the next uh, five weeks of time, we're going to take a look at what Scripture says about our great, big God. We are a community that loves to celebrate the love and the forgiveness of God. We are also a community that needs to learn how to stand in awe and reverence and respect of God. On Christmas Eve, we had the opportunity on our two campuses to be able to do one of the things I love to do, and that is on Christmas Eve, we light the candle and we sing Silent Night, Round Yon Virgin, beautiful. Christmas Eve service focused on how much did God so love the world that he gave his one and only son on our behalf. And as we focus upon that God is both merciful and mighty, we come to an understanding that we love to bask in the love of God. But failure to bask in the awe of God robs us of a sensitivity and an understanding that God is beyond our comprehension. That, that God is bigger, wider, deeper than we could ever think or we could ever ask or ever imagine. And like a flame, which is a beautiful flame, reminding us as, a, as, our, and as congregations that we're called to connect with God, to love our neighbor, and to serve our city, if we watch the flame on Christmas Eve go from one person to the next, the light, the people that in darkness sat, a glorious light have seen. But a flame is also powerful. A flame, we hear, is like God's consuming power. That he is like a flame, like a spark that can set the world ablaze. We're called to fear, to love, and to trust in God above all things. The same light that we lit on Christmas Eve has tremendous power. This last year, we saw what a flame could do to the great cathedral of Notre Dame. Power magnificence, whoa, and also tender, mercy, compassion, and care. Several years ago, a tragedy occurred. Aero flight, uh, Aero Peru had a flight, flight number 1603, 
and on October 2nd of 1996, 61 people perished. The plane crashed into the ocean. After much research was done, the cause of it was identified. The cause of the, the flight's demise was that in the process of cleaning the plane, these sensors that help figure out the balance of the plane, the position of the plane, how high to the ground, and so forth. Someone had covered over the sensors, as was the, the custom, in order to keep them clean from the chemicals they used for the rest of the plane. Someone took duct tape and they covered the sensors and they forgot to take the duct tape off. Flying without the fear of the Lord, of our great big God, is dangerous. It's even detrimental to our faith and to our life. We love to talk about the love of God, but merciful and mighty, they go together. This phrase, the fear of the Lord, is used throughout both the Old and the New Testaments. It's in reference to the prophets of old, and it's also in reference to our Savior Jesus, that even Jesus had the fear of the Lord. Some passages that we're going to look at over the next few weeks of time is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Fear of the Lord is the beginning place of wisdom. With proper reverential fear, it not only prolongs our days, but it also adds quality and value and worth to our days. That a fear of the Lord produces in us a strong confidence. One of the weeks that we're going to spend talking about our great big God, and the fear of the Lord is how do we overcome the fear of man, the fear of people? As one author wrote, don't be afraid of God, fear him, that the fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. It's the instruction of wisdom. It departs from evil. It leads to life. And it has great riches. In a book that I had the privilege to edit, uh, uh, talking about the fear of the Lord, one of our uh, former elders at St. John's, who now lives in uh, Castle Rock, uh, his name's Nathan Carlson, he, he wrote these words, the fear of the Lord is one of God's greatest blessings, but it's seldom taught, poorly understood, and usually misinterpreted. I am guilty as a pastor of not conveying the fear of the Lord. It was um, last week on Sunday when a young man from our congregation helped to deliver the sermon, and he brought up a topic that made me remarkably uncomfortable. And I began to go, who's going to be offended by this message? And what kind of damage control am I going to have to do? And are people going to leave because they heard what he said? And he spoke from his heart, and he spoke in love, and he spoke truth, but it was an unpopular thing. I was more concerned about the fear of people than I was about the fear of the Lord. But without the fear of the Lord in our everyday lives, we will attempt to navigate our Christian life with duct tape covering over our navigational static ports. Without the fear of the Lord, we don't know our positioning. 
Without the fear of the Lord, we can't exactly determine where we are or where we're headed or where we're going or what we're doing. Now, when we talk about the fear of the Lord, it's not some type of servile fear, something like a prisoner feels for his captor. It's a reverent fear of respect, like fearing a running chainsaw in your hand or sitting on the back of the racehorse for a first time, or stop stepping into a high-voltage enclosure. It's fearing a power that can be both extremely helpful, but also extremely dangerous. My dad worked for a little foreign brewery called Anheuser-Busch. Uh, perhaps you've, you've heard of them. And... My dad was an electrical engineer. And when it came to working on the big machines that produced cans for Anheuser-Busch and Pepsi and a whole other number of brands of cans, these machines would produce a fully formed can within a hundredth of a second. Within a hundredth of a second, those machines would do everything they need to do to stretch, to paint, to everything, produce a, a can. These were massive machines that required massive electricity. And my father had this phrase about electricity. There's two things in life you should fear, God and electricity. You should be afraid of those two things. My father, when working on one of the massive machines that uh, did all this uh, impressive labor, uh, they had a safety system. And the safety system was this. Is it off? And the other person would reply, yes. And then they would ask a second time, is it off? And the other person standing at the controls would say, Yes. And then they had a third thing that they did. They asked, is it off? And the person responds, yes. Well, the person that day, whether they didn't have their coffee or they weren't paying attention, my father began to work on a machine and the power was on and it nearly blinded him. He had to wear these cotton pads over his eyes for close to a month of time. It was a close call. The electricity that brought great power and is extremely helpful is also an electricity that can kill. That we have a God who has the power over life and death and the grave. We see examples in Scripture where someone with irreverence touches the tabernacle and they die. And we also see the same power spoken over Lazarus' grave. And Lazarus comes forth and he does. Without the fear of the Lord, we get off course. We lose our sense of surrounding. We become focused upon what we can see, what we can think, and what we can do. Let me tell you about a young, a young student of Scripture who actually took several classes at a seminary in contemplation of becoming a pastor. His name was Charles Darwin. Darwinian evolution. Charles Darwin lost sight of his static ports. And he began to see God as something that he could grasp only by his knowledge. He lost awe. He lost wonder. He lost connection with the Word of God. Someone who had a firm belief in a Creator 
rejected that creator. Now, most of you know the title of the book that he is famous for, The Origin of Species. And before I continue, let me tell you something today. Science is a gift. We rejoice in science. It helps us to understand the awe and the majesty, or to begin to understand the awe and majesty of God. We are not at odds with science. We just want good science. We're not at all at odds with theology. We just want good theology. We want both and, not either or. But Darwin got on the wrong course and crashed into a great sea of misunderstanding. And you can see that in the title of his book, The Origin of Species, or maybe I should say the subtitle of his book, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle of Life whole host of devils and evil comes from that understanding. That we favor one race over another. That we favor one generation over another. That we favor one gender over another. That we favor those who have more physical or emotional or spiritual strength over another rather than understanding that we were all created in God's image with great dignity and great respect. And we are to honor that dignity and respect from the very beginning to the very end of life as we know it. My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, Make your ear attentive to wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice in understanding. Would you read with me verse 4? If you seek her as silver and search for her as her hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and you'll discover the knowledge of God. Been on a treasure hunt? Been on an amazing endeavor? I mean, I learned this morning that, that Joe won his wife in a cakewalk, um, to which she responded, you know, life with you is not a cakewalk. I think there's something back and forth going on there. But what are you pursuing? Is it peace at any cost? Or are you pursuing just diversion and distraction, but I tell you, if you seek the Lord, as someone searches for silver and gold, you will not be disappointed because you'll discern the fear of the Lord and you'll discover the knowledge of God. Even this was said of our Savior Jesus in the words of Isaiah the prophet, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Oh, listen to what comes next. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. A text for us to ponder today comes to us from Philippians chapter 2. And Philippians chapter 2 is read at two very distinct times of the year. Philippians chapter 2 is read on Palm Sunday. And it's also read during Advent. Both of them referring to the coming of the Lord. And he considered equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And right after those words, the great song of Christ is called, the Carmen Christi, this great testimony that God, that as we, we heard the saying uh, over the last couple of weeks, that there are babies who became king, but there's only one king who became a baby. That God humbled himself to show his mercy and his power. And right after those words, 
from Philippians 2, we have these words here. Therefore, my beloved, my agapoes, the ones whom I serve and I love, the one whom Jesus put a towel around his waist and served, that's you and me. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, listen to these words. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We like to ignore those words. You see, working out our salvation with fear and trembling isn't, you better get your act together or else. Working out our salvation with fear and trembling is, there's no way I can get my act together. And I need a power greater than myself to rescue me from my insanity. To work out our salvation with fear and trembling is to understand that my God met, meets me where I am, but will never, ever leave me there. But instead desires for my life to exhibit his grace to others as well. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The same God who gives and the same God who forgives now invites you to give your life as a living sacrifice back to God. When we lose an understanding of the fear of the Lord, we lose awe and joy and mystery. And we leave things to where we try to figure them out. And that's like putting duct tape on the plane. It leads to a crash. There's two dangers, if you will. When we, go in a, when we grow in an awareness of God's holiness, and we stay only focused on the holiness of God, that leads to religio. The word religion means to tie or to bind with cords. Jesus said, I've come so that you may have life and have it abundantly. I have come to set you free. That leads to moralism or, or self-justification and so forth. Or the other danger is a growing awareness of our sinfulness, which leads to guilt, to fear, to shame, to insecurity, to despair, to fearing what other people think. But Christianity, when it's focused upon the cross where we see the holiness of God and we see the mercy of God together. A holy God who gives forgiveness and who also sets us apart for a life that is richer and deeper than we could ever think. Therefore, my beloved, we read, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because God is at work in you to fulfill his good purpose. As a community, I think we do a pretty good job talking about the love of God. It's my prayer that over the next few weeks of time, we're also going to have an opportunity to talk about the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom which is the beginning of understanding, which is the beginning of God's mercy, which is the beginning of life. Because we are working out what God has already been working in. And we're going to focus this year as two communities focused upon the common mission of raising up disciples of Jesus to do three things that with the fear of the Lord and with the love of the Lord, it will change our character. It will cause us to grow in knowledge. And it will open up to us a wide variety of ways to live those gifts that God has given to us out. The fear of the Lord. The love of the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Merciful and what? Mighty. Let us pray.